Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of See and Learn 2022. Tonight, we are in the village of Windward Side on a beautiful night, live at Lambie's place. The crowd is just starting to come in, and we have Duco, the island's famous mixologist, known for his gin and tonics, but tonight, he's serving something a little different. He's serving passion fruit and star juice proseccos. Passion fruits and st uh, star fruits both grow on the island, and they are fabulous. Thank you, Duco. We'll be with back live with you in about five minutes, and we'll be bringing you tonight our sargassum weed expert, Mr. Lowell Iperak. He lives in Florida, but as we all know, sargassum weed is a problem in many coastal areas. So stay tuned to learn what's good about it, what's bad, and we'll be back with you soon. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. How's your weekend? Everybody having a good time? It's a beautiful day on Seba. Welcome, everyone, to See and Learn 2022. We are live at the courtyard with Shea Buba Bistro as our host tonight. So let's hear it for Shea Buba Bistro. Hello to our international audience and our live streaming. If you can't be here with us tonight, we need to thank Carib Trans, who brings live streaming to everyone here and abroad. So thank you very much, Carib Trans. We have a great evening in store tonight to go with our great weather. And uh, before we get started, we have just a few introductions. Our uh, speaker tonight is hosted, sponsored by Iris House. Iris House is a beautiful two-bedroom, two-bathroom house in Windward Side with a pool. You can't believe how reasonably priced it is. Thank you, Michael and Tricia, for sponsoring our speaker this evening. We are, we, our event, uh, this is our 20th year, but our 19th event, thanks to COVID, would not be possible without the support of Prince Bernard Culture Funds and the public entity of SABA. So thank you to them. And then we have more than 50 sponsors. And these sponsors range, as you can see, uh, or you could see. <laughs> I didn't touch it. Uh, they range from our hardware store to our ferries to uh, hotels, restaurants, different houses around the world. So thank you to all of our sponsors for making this possible. Many of them are in the audience tonight. And you, any of you who are enjoying See and Learn, when you next go to any of these places, just give them a thank you for sponsoring our event. Uh, if you can't afford to buy a raffle ticket or you want to do something in addition to buying a raffle ticket, you can help us out immensely by writing a review. Reviews on Google are nice, but 
a nonprofit. What happened? Uh, by writing a review here, it really helps us for future private donors and for funding. So that would be very helpful. It takes about two minutes. And before we get started, we have to tell you about raffle tickets. They're only $5. You can't win if you don't play. We have a new sponsor of raffle tickets, and that is the 5K that is sponsored by Busy Bee. And that race is uh, coming up soon, but they are giving three free entries. Isn't that great? <laughs> so if you weren't going to run a 5K, now you have to. But we have rum from Veronica, which is Sabin Rock Living. Check these all out online. They're great prizes. Anna Keen with her Indigo Diving Hideaway Restaurant. Shea Booba, Tennis Lessons by Me, Jewelry by Marie, our uh, Organic Garden, doing a up to 10 persons free organic garden lessons. How cool is that? A guided hike from the Sabin Conservation Foundation, a 3D model from Aranax, and uh, the team that was here mapping Saba, Joe Bean, uh, our glass master of the island, the new Saba coffee table book, Aquamania Adventures doing a sunset cruise, and then the big prizes. The really cool things are the free three-night stays at some of the nicest homes on the island. We have Spyglass Villa. We have Larry and Sherry's Flamboyant Cottage in Booby Hill. These have incredible views, pools, you know, they're like you can't imagine. So for $5, you could have a reason to come back to Sabre or hang out with your friends, a cool thing. Then we have Mark uh, from the Cottage Club sponsoring his new penthouse for a three free night stay. So five bucks, and it really helps support us. That money goes toward all the things we don't get funding for, from our annual accountant to sponsoring our interns, printing costs. Okay, let's get going. <laughs> all right. Oh, I'm sorry. The big, big trip is the Caribbean Explorer, Explorer Adventures. So they sponsor a seven-night live-aboard boat. Uh, so you get meals, diving for seven nights. So can't beat that for $5. So that's, we have like $12,000 worth of prizes, and you got a pretty good chance to win. This isn't the lottery, right? How many people are entering? 17 prizes. Okay, so let's get started for the reason you all came here tonight, and let's talk about our speaker. Did you know that sargassum is edible? Did you know that you can fry it, boil it, steam it, or dry it? You like sushi? Well, maybe, similar. <laughs> Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it is not on tonight's menu. However, Lowell Iperak is here to whet your appetite for knowledge. Lowell currently works under the Marine Macroalgae Research Lab at Florida International University in Miami. Lowell is interested in the characteristics of marine macrophytes, which is seagrasses and microalgae, that make them suitable biogenic habitat for small invertebrate epifauna. He studies these interactions in shallow coastal systems including seagrass beds, mangrove prop roots, sorry, mangrove prop roots, and swash zones of sandy beaches. Lowell is also the communications manager of the International Sargassum Network, which is short for, or the, sh the acronym is SARGENET, listserv, and is chief program manager of the Sargassum Watch Citizen Science Program run on the Epicollect 5 app. He's doing a field project tomorrow afternoon. We can take sign-ups for that. We also have a diving field project tomorrow afternoon and a morning special hike to Wrangell Lizards, also known as Anolis, with Susan Perkins, who's here tonight. So don't sit home tomorrow. Don't sleep in. we got a jam-packed schedule. Sign up and have a blast. So let's give a big save and welcome to Lowell Hyperact. Can you all hear me? Ah, yes, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, I do want to thank the CLR Foundation for, you know, sponsoring me to bring, my, bring me here. And definitely thank you for all for taking the time. Can you all hear, can you also hear me? All right, all right. To, um, to definitely take some time out of your day to really, lis to really listen about all the stuff I have to say about beautiful seaweeds and beautiful sargassum. Uh, so, of course, 
Um, my presentation is Seeking Sargassum, what it is, what we know, what we're doing. Um, I've, I am, of course, supported by the Marine Macroalgae Research Lab, as well as the uh, Florida International University Center for Aquatic Chemistry and Environment. Uh, they definitely helped to kind of help me fly over here. And a lot of the pictures of Sargassum that are, look like they're in, in, up the sandy beaches are mostly from my citizen science project um, that I will be talking about in the latter half of my presentation. But just to get a little bit of who I am, I was a California boy. I lived in the States, uh, did my under, undergrad there, and then when I got to have a PhD, I traveled cross country over to Miami, Florida. Um, and during my seven years of being in Miami, I get to experience some of the most interesting, beautiful subtropical ecosystems um, that we have around here. And of course, just for context, we're kind of over here, so I'm definitely making my way around the hemispheres. Really exciting. <laughs> so knowing me and my passions, yes, I am a PhD candidate. Therefore, my first priority should be research. But I love teaching, and I love public engagement. And I, de and I definitely love seeing and hearing connections on what we know about the environment, how scientists can be able to help bridge links between what we know about nature and how can we as human beings can live in harmony together with nature. And I study macroalgae, so macro meaning big, but I'm probably going to use mostly the very common term called seaweeds. Seaweeds come in all shapes, colors, and sizes, such as the kelp forest in Catalina Island, California, when I was snorkeling in the very cold waters, and some very small uh, calerpas, alimedas, all kinds of diverse green and brown um, algae in, in Crandon Park, Florida. And I particularly study this in the context of these algae serving nice habitats for very small critters. Uh, hermit crabs, isopods, snails, uh, this shrimp looking thing is actually called an amphipod. And I look at the interactions between the flora that make the habitat and the little um, epifauna, that's where I'll just use the term invertebrates, um, that kind of makes these algae home. Uh, of course, these little amphipods and snails, they like to eat um, smaller algae, so they're good janitors, they're good gardeners, and they make good fish food. Um, and, so they're basic, and so just these two biological communities, very difficult to study because you have to consider so much biodiversity, um, but they make such an essential part of a shallow coastal system. Now, just to get, kind of get some basic stuff out of the way, there's this whole scientific debate, are algae and plants the same thing? Um, I'm going to argue, well, depending how you cut the, cut the evolution, not really, um, because a lot of people tend to confuse algae and seagrass a lot. The big thing that I wanted to display here is that um, in the seagrass on the right is a true plant, and they have a vascular system. What does that mean? It means that they have leaves, they have stems, and they have roots. And algae, even though they kind of look like they have leaves and roots, they kind of don't. Um, they have blades, they have stipes, they have whole fasts. Um, rather than having the roots suck up the nutrients, usually the algae are able to basically be like sponges and take nutrients and, and other um, foods and contaminants straight from their tissues. Um, and that could have implications of how these algae would grow and survive in, in the very complex marine environment. So. I uh, definitely want to start off that, you know, s um, in terms of sargassum, it is a type of macroalgae bloom, and you either like it or you hate it. Regardless, uh, we're definitely not alone in realizing that macroalgal blooms, influxes, and inundations are becoming a very common problem worldwide. So, for example, here in 2008, um, China had their um, Olympics, and they were inundated with this green algae called ova, and so they have to spend... Uh, billions of dollars to get bulldozers to kind of grab all that seaweed, uh, making sure it doesn't uh, mess up their beaches. Here is uh, some green algae, Calorpa, in the Mediterranean Sea. Here is one in Hawaii. In Florida, not that newsworthy, but we do have a s uh, very small and persistent bloom of Nadiomeni. That's kind of like this tiny lettuce-looking algae that we've been having for almost 10 years. Um, and I don't know how many of you Apparently, uh, the Rugalopteryx influxes have made, have made their way in Spain within the last few years, and I've heard that kind of got a little bit of news coverage as well. Uh, so 
Um, of course, we definitely need to link the different factors and mechanisms to, under to understand this largely global phenomenon with different variations and um, in interactions between, say, in the Caribbean versus China versus Florida and versus the Mediterranean Sea. And sargassum influxes are definitely a regional problem that throughout the Caribbean. And these are some examples that were taken this year alone. Uh, we had a nice observation in Bonaire, one in Costa Rica, uh, one in Mexico. Something that I really wanted to emphasize here, um, as much as you know, we tend to think a lot about the ecological devastation when, when it comes to um, a lot of fish kills coinciding with sargassum. But as scientists, um, as I got to remember that the science that we do definitely has an impact on the communities that we work with. Um, sargassum does not exist in isolation. People are getting involved in this somehow. And whenever I do my science, I always think back, it's like, okay, how can I provide my knowledge to help people? Uh, it's not something that we ecologists tend, tend to think about very often, but when we think in terms of conservation or management, how do people interact with sargassum in such a positive, negative, or really neutral way? I always tend to keep that human aspect in mind. Okay. Uh, so, meets a little bit, Palachia sargassum, you'll get to either love or hate this algae really soon. It is a brown seaweed. Depending on how you cut the taxonomy, um, there are over 300 species known to science worldwide. But only two of them actually make up those blooms, and that is going to be sargassum natans and sargassum fluitans. Um, they tend to come these different numbers, which I will get to in a little bit, but they have a pelagic lifestyle, meaning they don't really touch the floor throughout their entire lives, and the only time they do is if they wash them on the beach, dead or dying. Um, and they definitely make up these blooms and influxes. So this is interesting because this is an algae that spends an entire life in the open ocean. And before these influxes, well, actually, let me, let me go back a little bit. Um, just to kind of hit home that I studied the shallow coastal system. So here is you know, my, my bed of seagrass, algae. And within them, you have all kinds of bugs, um, insects, invert I'm sorry, um, invertebrates, crustaceans worms that are kind of using the algae or seagrass as habitat. And then even though all of these seagrass and algae eventually wash up on the beaches, they could be decomposing, they could be stinking, um, but they would also be serving as food and habitat for a completely different um, community of invertebrates, such as flies, beetles, and amphipods. And hopefully we'll experience some of that today. And so how does influx sargassum affect the shallow coastal system? Um, I can speak in terms of the general Caribbean. I do not know how um, sargassum has affected a Sabin coastal, coastal fauna or flora, but I can tell, for example, in Mexico, there was a study done in 2015. Um, Dr. Brigitte Van Tussenbroek and her team, they looked at what happened when sargassum inundations hit the their Mexican coast in 2017, all their sea grasses got wiped out and replaced with macroalgae. Um, that, that influx of sargassum, uh, because of it just being there, being stagnant and decomposing, it reduced the oxygen and light availability uh, in, in those Mexican shallow coastal systems. In a separate study um, done in Mexico, um, Dr. Rodriguez Martinez and another in by Cruz de Vera, they kind of quantify the amount of fauna that actually washed up coinciding with the sargassum, and they definitely found a lot of commercially important fish and invertebrate species, some which are actually very commercially viable, um, such as lobsters. Um, and, the, and a lot of the fish that kind of washed up event are actually coming from coral reefs that are actually slightly farther away. And of course, they wash up on the beach and they, they tend to accumulate um, by the tons. So in this, in this context, the, am the amount of sargassum is causing a, causing a lot of ecological problems. Um, but as a scientist, I'm like, hmm, I wonder what the bugs are doing. <laughs> I wonder what are the small invertebrates are handling uh, this sargassum phenomenon. And that's what drove a lot of my dissertation research. And so when, and so I want to get some context about where, this sarga where does sargassum actually come from. How many of you have heard about the Sargasso Sea? It is a very, very famous um, area where the Sargasso uh, originally, originally came from. 
And this is a figure that was published two years ago by Elizabeth Johns, where, um, where it used to be that the sargassum is mostly in the Sargasso Sea. Around 2009, 2010, there was an extreme North Atlantic oscillation event. That's fancy for all the El, Nino, El Ninos and La Ninas. Um, that, that it actually kind of freed up some sargassum from this um, cycle, and then it kind of made its way into Europe and North Africa. And so through, the, through these um, surface water currents, the part, bits and pieces of sargassum eventually kind of made its way into this mess of wind and water currents, which I will call the North Equatorial Recirculation Region. Um, which is basically this very fancy, very fancy term for this area between Brazil and West Africa. And over time, through a multitude of different factors, such as nutrient availability, uh, differences in temperature and solidity, um, differences in wind patterns, eventually a second sargasso sea started to emerge. A second source of sargassum um, eventually formed um, in around areas where, where, the yellow, where this part of the yellow is actually at. And since then, in 2011, a lot of people think maybe the Sargasso is coming from the Sargasso Sea. It's actually coming from down here. And uh, there was a paper published three years ago that finally gave this thing a name. It's called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And in the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt has been causing quite a bit of devastation within the past um, 10 plus years. Um, it's been problems since 2011. And and this is just a summary of, of you know, some of the different factors, such as nutrients. Early reports said, or oh, maybe deforestation in, in Brazil or the Saharan Africa does could be contributing uh, to the growth um, and distribution of sargassum. Surface water currents, uh, wind patterns could be affecting the distribution, um, changes in solidity, um, and of course, the nor of course fluctuations with uh, El Nino and La Nina. Basically, there's a lot of work that needs to understand what, where the heck did this thing came from, <laughs> if you will. And out in space, you know, this is kind of an exception because, you know, you could definitely see the very large um, mats of sargassum. But I think the majority of the time, especially when you view a space, they kind of look like this. They look like these uh, very small linear windrows, and eventually they would just kind of accumulate and, and, be and become the... Um, in inundations that would eventually make their way into their beaches, right? Um, but I did a, did a little bit of, you know, reality check about the sargassum from a negative aspect. Sargassum is not bad. It's not inherently bad. I've talked with some of you folks that you find cute little uh, marine fauna. Um, in the Sargasso Sea, a lot of invertebrates um, it's, and fish and sea turtles, they use sargassum as habitat. Um, if you can see, some of them might be hard to see, like there's a sargassum crab right here, there's a little nudibranch, uh, there's a sargassum frogfish. They definitely have adapted over um, thousands and millions of years of evolution to basically look like sargassum. Um, eventually make it the way to look, look like camouflage, and baby, and baby sea turtles basically like to use them as um, cover from predators. And even from the land of sargassum, there is life. Um, there are definitely different animals that are using them. And a lot of the animals, I could speak from Florida, um, these little shrimp things, you're going to either love them or hate them. They're called amphipods. Um, they have all kinds of names, sand fleas, scuds. Um, this cockroach-looking thing is actually a beetle. Uh, flies tend to, use, tend to associate with sargassum a lot. Um, I also decided to add a few pictures because um, I was with some kids the other day and we were digging up sargassum. Apparently, um, you can find hermit crabs in, in the sargassum. Um, this little insect hiding under this rock um, is an earwig, which is strange because I usually find them in gardens, but then kind of finding them close to the ocean, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. I don't expect to find an earwig here. Uh, <laughs> so, and so I want to get us a little bit acquainted before I get into the nitty gritty of the research to really understand the different morphotypes of sargassum. And so if you decide to come to the field trip tomorrow, and I think after we play our little mini game, um, I'm going to be passing around this bag of sargassum that has all the three morphotypes. I do not recommend you open this. It's been there for almost a week. Uh, so, so we're definitely going to take a look at sargassum fluidins 3, sargassum natins 1, and sargassum natins 8. And um, 
there are definitely a lot more uh, morpho types of sargassum. I think there's around 10 per the two species, sargassum dates and sargassum fluitants. Um, but this is a nice little guy that Jeffrey Shell and his team have basically concocted from 2015. And we're definitely going to break this down. But basically, all of this sargassum uh, is been characterized by the overall structural complexity. So what does it look like on the outside? As well as the little minute traits on the inside. All right? So for sargassum natins one, very skinny looking. Um, Definitely has no thorns on the stem, but if you look at their little air bubbles, as some of the kids would like to call it, they have a nice little spine sort of sticking out. And if you look at their blades, um, maybe I would call them leaves just for, you know, ease accessibility, their blades are actually very narrow. It's kind of like, also like paper thin. You contrast that with Sargassa Fluitens 3, where it has this bushy looking um, look when it's put together. So I would call it that high structural complexity. They don't have the thorns on the air bladders, but they do have the thorns on the stem. Or if I use an algae the term thallus, let's call it stem for now. Um, and their little blades tend to be more oval. So, right? so, and finally, I have to call, I like to call this the monster, because if you compare it to the other two sargassum, their traits are actually very exaggerated. Uh, so you have, but the very interesting is that they don't have the thorns on the stem and they don't have the thorns on the air bladders, and their leaves uh, tend to be obnoxiously long um, if, you compare, if you can put the uh, sargassomorpho type side by side. All right. And why I learn about these different morpho types? Um, so like I said, there used to be, in, in science, um, we only care about two species. That was sargassum fluitens and sargassum natens. And and there was this scientist named Parr who went out on the ship early 1939, and they were looking at what's been happening with Sargasso and the Sargassum Sea. Usually, if you look at textbooks, uh, Sargassum Fluitens 3 and Sargassum Natens 1 um, tends to be the representative for just this species. Um, and, so you, 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 and so a lot of scientists, they don't really look at the number um, behind the morphotype. Uh, but then, Fast forward to 2015, this algae sargassum in Zay started to pop up um, in, in along the open ocean and along the beaches where they definitely landed. And so when back in the day where we don't really bat a second eye about morphotypes, we're going back to Parr's paper and like, wait a minute, okay, what's going on here? Uh, <laughs> so um, very important to note that these morphotypes could be useful in understanding the origin, dispersal, and the fate of the sargassum in which they land. All right. I talked a little bit about the morphotypes. Are y'all able to get that information? Y'all want to play a little game? <laughs> yeah, all right. So let's have a nice little mini game uh, about which morphotype is it. Hopefully there won't be too many tricks. And I'm going to present um, all of these pictures were taken from the internet. And I'm going to start with this bushy looking one. Uh, which morphotype is it? Nathan's eight. Nathan's eight. Nathan's one, very bushy looking. Uh, it's actually Sargassum Fluitens 3. I'm, I'm curious to see how the pictures are going to look uh, because they definitely have the little spines right here. Yeah, it's not a very good picture. Uh, but let's see if we can get ourselves a nice little close up. What about this one? The first? Nathan's one. Nice call. Look, what's this cute little hint right here? There's a thorn on the spine. Yes, this is Sargassum Nathan's one. Cool. All right. What about this one? This is a nice little close-up. Some of y'all said the third one. Some of y'all said A. Hopefully, I can scooch out of the way. How about this little hint right here? The second one? All right. This, this little thorns on the stem. Sargassum Fluitens 3. All right. Don't worry, we're all learning here. What about this skinny look? What about this skinny looking dude? Nathan's one. Nathan's one. Yeah, y'all getting better at it. Nathan's one, very low complexity, a lot of spaces in, in between the branches. All right, also not a very good picture. Your hints are these obnoxious looking branches. Nathan's, Nathan's eight. Absolutely correct. This is Nathan's eight. All right. 
Um, this one, we'll look at the two different ones. What about the one on the left? I'm hearing eight. All right. What about the one on the right? Nathan's one. Y'all are correct. Nathan's eight and Nathan's one. Cool. All right. Now let's get back to the presentation. I have four chapters in my dissertation. I'm not going to present all of them. Yes. The forms, are they for uh, to keep predators away or are they for uh, keeping the mass together? That's a very good question. I don't know. Um, I definitely felt some of these thorns, they don't seem very harmful at all. I think if you, well, definitely do this with fresh specimens, but definitely, you know, feel around the sargassum, they, they don't seem to have any defense uses for it. Um, possibly. I think for a lot of these sargassum, they're often entangled and associated with each other. Uh, but that could also be because of, like, the fact that they're so full of branches and stuff that eventually the branches of these three sargassum events are just entangled with each other. So, yeah. And I'll be talking a little bit about um, just, just two of these chapters. Um, one, I'll be looking at um, habitat and food use. Um, by the sargassum used by the invertebrates, and then I'll be talking a little bit about monitoring sargassum using citizen science. Uh, so le definitely, let's jump right in here. Uh, so sargassum landings on the beaches, you know, they definitely increase the load of sea rack. That's just a fancy term for sea grasses and algae that just wash up on the beaches um, that are often made by local materials. So here's one of my favorite beaches in Crandon Park. Uh, most of this is sea grass. Um, definitely not a very sargassum looking um, looking landing. Um, here is a rack, here's my little chocolates, um, scaled up with this rack full of sargassum and seagrass, uh, if you will. And, and, uh, and my question would be, you know, what does this land of sargassum being used for? Is it used by habitat? Um, are, is, this multi is this large amount of sargassum um, providing some kind of shade and cooling spot for the little bugs that I was showing earlier? Um, is it used as food? Um, all that biomass is edible, and if you could combat the little nastiness, probably made from chemicals, you could, uh, you could basically get an all guinea buffet um, if you were definitely a beetle um, or, or, an, or an amphipod. And so, that is, and so that is driving a lot of my questions. I will be talking about some icky, complicated stuff, but here what I have um, is a food web of who eats who, maybe. Um, this trophic webs are very complex and difficult to study, um, and so there are a lot of ways that you could approach, you know, appro approaching, you know, how to draw out accurately these different uh, trophic webs. Um, is this land plant being eaten by this beetle or eaten by this amphipod? You could either try to gather all your players and then observe them. You, you can make them in little experiments and just, you know, kind of tally it up. Or what, I'm tr or what I did um, to look, to try to get a snapshot of the different, uh, the, the, the different players of, of this trophic food web is basically collecting a lot of tissues and just running it through some machines um, to get their stable isotopes. Uh, what the heck is a stable isotope? Think of them as kind of, kind of elemental markers um, that, that gives a snapshot of, of what this trophic web could be drawn, drawn as. And so the two stable isotopes that, I, that I'm using are for carbon. Um, that just kind of outlines how different these primary producers are. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, different plants or algae. Um, and the nitrogen 15, which is kind of showing how high each of these um, positions are in, in, the grand, in the grand food web. Right? And so my little study is once again in Florida, and I'll be look and I examine two beaches um, that definitely had its fair share of bad days with sargassum. And for the microhabitat experiment um, that that I ended up doing, basically I just made all kinds of different treatments. Um, but we have these very semi-expensive, as for a graduate student. Um, temperature loggers that would try to log temperatures every 15 minutes or so, and I would take one of these, bury it under the sargassum, put these in a cute little bag, bury these under sand, put this together like any real scientist would do, and kind of lay one exposed above the ground. And, you know, I think what's going to happen, I think the sargassum is going to buy some kind of cool, cooling on place for, um, for better temperatures for better invertebrates. And this is what it looks like on the field. Um, 
Some days are just windy, so I gotta make sure that my little hobos don't fly off. Um, other days, try, try my busy to kind of keep away, so make sure that birds and mosquitoes don't, you know, snag my equipment. And when you look, and this is what the results that I was getting, trying these four different trials, and just to kind of guide you through this spaghetti graph, here is the time uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., so just gonna look at what happens at the daytime, and the temperature in degrees Celsius. Biggest take home message. Uh, when, when temperature is, is an exposed sand, it is super hot. And imagine yourself out on the beach, you know, you, you touch sand barefoot, it's pretty hot and you want to keep your sandals on. For, for temperature under sargassum, it's a very cool and stable 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. It's not that terrible. Um, if, you're, if you are a nice little bug try, trying to get away from the, from the summer tropical heat. Right, so there is potential um, to look to that this sargassum could be used as habitat for a lot of the invertebrates. For the stable isotopes, I, there are definitely a lot of studies done in the Mediterranean, uh, not so much in the tropics, um, let alone in the context of sargassum influxes. So I was kind of in blindly out on these two sites and just collecting whatever I think looks like a player um, in the shallow coastal system. So I collected land plants, sargassum, seagrass, um, the other algae, uh, this is copamania, um, whatever invertebrates I could catch through swinging my butterfly net around and putting little jars um, in, in the sand and, and basically drying, grinding, and putting them onto machine. And oh my god, what kind of graph is this? Um, this is a plot that tries to plot out the um, 13 carbon at the bottom, so that will help kind of discern how different land plants are from, from, the, uh, from, the, sea, from the sea grasses and the algaes, and then you have your 15 nitrogen that tries to mark out the trophic position. Um, this is still a work in development, um, so don't take my word for it, here, but here's some cool observations. If I draw this line at the center, um, First observation that I see, here is the land plants, and here are the um, marine sources of food, or potential food. So sargassum is all the way down here. Uh, very low nitrogen. It's not in the open ocean, so it doesn't really get that much nutrients. Um, compared to sea grasses and Crandon Park and other algae um, in, in, in uh, Ms. L. Johnson State Park. Um, so we can say that, you know, that these marine sources of food are definitely different uh, from land. Second observation that I see is that the, a lot of the invertebrates uh, tend to gravitate towards the marine stuff. They don't really like the land stuff, um, even, though the, even though the land-based food sources are definitely there. So something is definitely going on. I do question if, if some invertebrates do um, actively eat sargassum. I don't have videos, but they are definitely... Um, what is it? Uh, I've definitely seen amphipods kind of eat this stuff, but again, a lot of research needs to be done um, on this subject matter. So it is a work in progress, but the possible conclusions are it could be habitat, it could be a food source. Uh, <laughs> so, but there doesn't seem to be an ob obvious link to sargassum yet, but I think it's very likely that it might be. And of course, I'm, I wasn't able to construct the whole food web, but I do suspect that sargassum seems to be a foraging ground for a larger fauna. Um, on the left, I'm going to play these two videos in tandem. This is an introduced uh, spiny backed iguana. You can see it's kind of snapping its mouth, uh, probably grabbing the little bugs that was kind of hopping out of the sargassum. On the right, you have the white ibis, and you can see it's kind of using its little uh, beaks to kind of drill down to drill down to the sea rack and try to get what other bugs or worms are there. So these animals are not scared of sargassum. They see that as an opportunity. And if anything, um, this, we definitely take these sandy beaches for granted, and we definitely need more beach coastal ecolo um, ecologists, especially since a lot of these beaches tend to have very high recreational and tourism use um, as much, right? And so that's all I have for the really um, infield stuff. And now I'm going to be moving on to uh, my citizen science program using photos to uh, monitor and characterize the amount of sargassum that, that is kind of coming in. Um, the good news is um, for, for all the sargassum that has been piling and making its way since 2011, there has been a lot of advancements in the science of it. Um, definitely a lot of satellite imagery being done. 
and however, and they they're definitely these nice, beautiful models that would uh, try to predict where the sargassum is going to land. Um, but as much as these uh, satellite images are really important, they often lack in resolution um, in terms of trying to predict, oh, what's going to happen exactly in Seba? I know it's going to be bad, but how bad is it going to be? I know that Florida is probably going to be, you know, not, not too terrible, but maybe there will be a few freak events where there is going to be some sargassum just piling up. Uh, so these large satellite regional models can be further refined by having on-ground observations of sargassum. And so this regional problem of sargassum is challenging existing local monitoring and satellite programs. Having different methods like citizen science can definitely help um, these very complex models and bringing in people to kind of work together on this very heavy issue, right? And so around 2019, I developed my citizen science program called Sargassum Watch. And I definitely use this to kind of track um, the accumulation levels of sargassum. And I'll show you what the data looks like, or at least how we collect the data and analyze it. Um, look at how the accumulations occur over time, over space, and what are the morphotypes, which, by the way, I, for I totally forgot to uh, share this with y'all. But if y'all want to take a look at some of the morphotypes um, that y'all just kind of play around with in a little mini game, um, definitely be my guest. Again, don't open the bag. Uh, <laughs> so, and how they definitely have occurred um, throughout the different regions. And so, if you, if you decide to play with the Citizen Science app tonight or come to the field project tomorrow, um, you will see that the form that we use is pretty long. I try to cover a lot of bases with um, the data collected by citizens, date and time, GPS coordinates, was there cleanup. Uh, but the most important information are actually these pictures that you took here. This is when I was uh, dealing with daycare kids up earlier this week. Um, and so some of the most important photos here include a panoramic view. Um, in this case, it, this is Cove Bay, right? This is Cove Bay uh, from the left, the front, and the right side view. And digging into the sargassum, hopefully you're not too icky about germs, um, trying to see if all three morphotypes are present and trying to take one picture showing all of them. And so um, as of today, f throughout the three plus years we, I had a citizen science pro project, we have only over 6,000 observations. And no, I did not process all of them. And neither did my team. It's definitely a lot of data. Um, but with the photos that we collected, um, we try to classify the site um, accumulation level from level one through four, where one, we have very little to no sargassum, um, all the way to level four, where you have a very high accumulation that's used to kind of answer questions related to space, uh, spatial and temporal variation of the sargassum. And for the morphotypes, we mark them for presence absence, and then that addresses the variation in the amount of morphotypes that was available uh, coinciding with these influxes. And so this was data that's collected at that time when I published this work. Um, there's a handy dandy scientific article if you're in the nitty gritty stuff. Um, we've had we looked at 1,900 observations within the past decade. I supplemented this with iNaturalist, which is another really cool citizen science app, if you don't know what that is. Um, but some observations that you see here, um, Florida and the Gulf of Mexico got it good. They don't have to deal with sargassum too much. Um, I would question this year, however, because I was definitely talking to some folks on the year 2022. After this uh, paper was published, they supposedly have their worst season of sargassum. Um, Florida and the Gulf of Mexico definitely don't have it as bad as the greater Caribbean and western Caribbean regions. Of, of, but of course, you know, Florida, a lot of our collaborators and volunteers are Florida, so we have over a thousand observations throughout this entire greater Caribbean. 271, not a very impressive number. So if you're interested in contributing to the Citizen Science Project, please come over to me, because I would definitely love having observations of, of monitoring from SABA to basically increase this number of citizen science observations and probably will cut it to you know, increased um, size specificity. Because of course, the Eastern Caribbean, as shown in the silent images, definitely has a different sort of impact than, say, uh, Cuba, for example, right? 
Uh, second thing is this very hon honky graph um, that looks at the probability of finding any of the morphotypes. And so this was divided into Greater Caribbean, Western Caribbean, the Floridian, and the Bahamian region. Going from left to right is the accumulation level and the probability you're going to find any of the three morphotypes. Of course, um, if you have sargassum accumulating, you will always find any of the three morphotypes of sargassum. But the most common one is this orange one, which is sargassum fluidins 3 which is not a really big surprise because sargassum fluid history has been around be even before and especially during the sargassum uh, inundations. But the second most common one is this blue line, which is sargassum natans So that's that monster with no thorns at all. And this was very consistent with the shipboard um, observations that happened after 2011. So, okay, something's up. We were able to match what happens in the, out in the open ocean with, with what happens on land. And so we were able, and so, you know, the citizen science program is definitely kind of making those very interesting links about what happens in the open ocean done by very well-trained scientists and volunteers like you and me. <laughs> it just thought was really cool. Um, we also want to look at the seasonal variation. I have my hats off to volunteers from the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program and a security guard at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Um, and so we definitely had two sites in, in Mexico and two sites in the uh, Floridian subregion, but we just kind of combined it into these um, subregions. Um, and so what we have here are these little density plots. Um, again, um, just looking at when, are, when exactly are the peaks of sargassum for each of the months. So uh, again, we have in Florida, um, there are definitely few, but definitely more punctual um, seasons of high accumulation of sargassum, um, whereas in the Western Caribbean, um, actually it might be better if I do this, because what I do here is I actually isolate the uh, level four um, accumulation level events. The Western Caribbean is a lot more protracted and prolonged. And so they definitely had more months when they have very high accumulations rather than uh, Florida where it's just a few freak events. Sargassum. And this is definitely matching the satellite images. Because the satellite images, we definitely see a lot of red um, and definitely high probability sargassum landing in the greater Caribbean and especially in the western Caribbean. Um, but uh, once every now and then they would report something like, we predicted there's going to be a lot of sargassum, but it actually went down. This is really weird because, it, because this is very similar to what happened this year, last year or two years ago. And so having the citizen science data could actually help um, kind of fine tune um, those satellite Im images that were shown very earlier, right? Being able to complement the community science photos with other methods, um, I think it's very optimistic that this is a regional problem um, and that there is definitely a lot of room of collaboration. One of the things that we thought about doing is looking at a picture and estimating the amount of biomass. So I'm like, all right, this is level two observation. Um, we're thinking this might have 1,500 grams per meter square per day, which sounds ridiculous. Um, but of course, you know, you can then estimate the amount of invertebrates. Um, and then we clocked in like 2,000 individuals invertebrates per meter squared, which once again sounds a little crazy, but I have a nice little video right here. Um, this one you might have to be a quite a little bit because you're going to hear a lot of pitter-patter um, and a lot of pixels moving that represents um, these hundreds of thousands of amphipods. So all these little pixels that you see right here is these little guys right here. And they're, they're jumping out of this log, um, moving away from the sargassum, probably moving to some kind, to some kind of tree uh, or what have you. So, once again, you know, these, um, this information for photos can definitely be useful as an open source database, uh, which we could complement with other methods, whether it be drones, satellites, or um, these quadrats that other folks have been doing. Um, trying to synthesize the data into a set of numbers that then we could use to answer questions related to satellites at a regional level, or looking at how many bugs or uh, how many nutrients or, or toxic metals have been accumulated and possibly released by sargassum as it decomposes. Um, so looking at the system, looking at the synthesis of information at different scales, uh, which is going to be really important because the uh, sargassum 
um, inundations is an ecological consequence with social impacts. This is a nice day out at uh, Cancun in Mexico. Um, this is what Cancun looks like on a bad day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, definitely has a lot of impacts for the tourism industry, um, local communities that really depend on the revenue and income. Um, as well as fishermen that, that could have their nets kind of tangled up by the sargassum. Uh, but the good news is there's definitely a lot of work being done uh, to try to manage the sargassum. Uh, Dr. Hazel Octaford and her team, um, they definitely made these, um, the Surmi Sargassum Brief that tries to kind of put together, you know, depending on where you are, these are some of the solutions you could think about when managing sargassum. Some, um, of course, one size not fit all. It definitely depends on your local uh, geographic, social, and economic conditions. Some folks can, can definitely take the way of just grabbing a bunch of people, getting a wheelbarrow, and, um, and cleaning it up by hand. But maybe you might be a situation, oh my God, it's way too much sir, gas. I have a nice speech. I want to get it out. So instead, you'll probably go and eat tractors. Um, or you're probably going to need these SARG boats, um, just being mindful about, you know, any sort of environmental impact. Um, I, there are solutions as to kind of putting up these barriers for sargassum and then kind of having the uh, sargassum kind of move elsewhere. Some of these solutions uh, could be questionable, uh, but it really depends on uh, what's to be done and what kinds of impacts that you should definitely be acknowledging. Uh, the most important thing is to really educate decision makers and definitely a lot of community members about uh, what Sargasso is and the different um, goods, bads, and uglies behind it. Uh, and of course, with the amount of Sargasso, there's definitely a lot of opportunity. Uh, some people like to eat it. Some, um, including this fisherman in Mexico, they they would take the sargassum, dry it up, and turn it into uh, adobe sargo blocks that they could use to build houses to lower the cost of housing. Um, this, this entire image right here was made by the Food and Agricultural Organization that lists out what you can do with one ton of fresh sargassum. Um, there's definitely a lot of room for, for opportunity um, and innovation. Uh, and, and given that, uh, we definitely live in what I call the phycological era. <laughs> so there's definitely algal blooms everywhere. Um, it doesn't have to be seaweed. Um, but even basic questions about what the heck is this? Definitely a room for, for scientific investigation in terms of basic ecology. How do they, how do they respond to nutrients and increases in environmental conditions? Um, before even getting into that engineering and making products uh, sort of approaches. Um, local, these problems have local media challenges, but the problems and the, system, the systemic mechanisms are regional and definitely extends to a global scale. Uh, we can definitely see that algae are cleaning the planet or indicating that something's wrong um, in terms of the planetary mess. And we can definitely look at algae as kind of par being part of the cleaning or the restoration process. Uh, and so there are definitely a lot of scientists and uh, entrepreneurs that were definitely taking advantage of using algae um, as a solution uh, rather than a problem uh, here. But probably one of the most important things I want to um, get at is that science is very collaborative. Um, gone are the days where a scientist is going to be stuck in the little bench, um, just kind of isolated from the world, and that is really bad science. Um, you certainly cannot do science without people. I will also extend uh, to the idea that a lot of these uh, sargassum inundations involve Caribbean countries, and they, of course, have histories of colonialism and imperialism. And whenever, whenever I think about the sort of you know, how does my science impact the people that I work with? I always want to make sure that the data that I give, uh, the presentations that, the presentations that I gave, the relationships I build with people are built in a very equitable, equal, and, and mutual manner. And so in this case, I want to take the time to really thank all the volunteers and organizations that help collect data, ranging from in Florida to Mexico, Grand Cayman, um, in the Bahamas. Um, and this is a really nice, um, slide to end off if you're interested in coming to the field project tomorrow. Um, these QR codes right here, hopefully, I don't know where the internet situation is um, on your phone, but you could definitely scan uh, and download the EpiCollect 5 app and, 
and add the Sargassum Watch project. Um, I can't guarantee what the internet's going to look like um, when we go to Cove Bay. Um, but if you're interested in looking at uh, what the data looks like, it is open source. You could take a look at the 6,000 plus pictures. Um, within there, our Sargassum Watch open source database, that's, that's where this QR code is going to lead to. And that is where I cue the end of my presentation. I'll take any questions from here. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah Hampers. Yes, uh, the Sargassums uh, present in waters off the west coast of North America. Are there Sargassum present off the west coast of North Amer America? Okay, so there is Sargassum. Um, I'm thinking of a different species, actually. Um, it's actually Sargassum muticum. Um, it is a benthic Sargassum that stays at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, originated from Japan and made its way into the coast of, ca of California. Um, but that is a very different problem altogether. Uh, but there's definitely, certainly Sargassum um, all, all over the world. Um, but that's, that's kind of like the major one that I thought of uh, when he asked me that question. Okay, I think I saw your hand first. And then I'll go to you. Um, well, I wanted to ask about the, the punctuated high inundation is that because it's decomposed that quickly, or is that because someone's cleaned it up and then it re had another episode of high inundation? All right. So the question is, looking at the punctuated graphs, when, when Florida, maybe the West Caribbean went down, is it because they decompose so quickly, or is it because they, they are managed? So in this graph, you can't really see it because this is all data per month. I could tell you from experience, just kind of look at from the day to day, uh, sargassum would usually disappear when there's a cleanup. Now, I try to use these, um, obs obs these sites, if you will, because there is little to no cleanup and there shouldn't be, because that's definitely a confounding factor. Um, but if there is no cleanups, um, other factors such as, I'm trying to remember here, t tidal patterns when the, when the tides kind of grab sargassum and then kind of takes it away from the beaches into the water. That is definitely another mechanism that they used to um, get rid of sargassum naturally. Um, there was a pub paper published um, also, also in Western Mexico that kind of explored, explored this phenomenon. Um, but it, it usually depends on the local site. Yeah. Yes. I grew up in Maine, and we used uh, seaweed to boil the lobster and put on the gardens. Yeah. And now, I've read recently that the sargassum is actually contains, I can't remember, some sort of mineral um, that is creates a toxic environment when you're using it for fertilizer. So it would be great if we can use it for something and get it out of Cove Bay. Is that, what is the situation with that? That's a very good question. So you're, you're asking about the toxic mineral that would that is in sargassum, and you can't really use it for Cove Bay. So uh, what I've heard a lot for in terms of management strategies, the thing that I'm very iffy with sargassum use for consumption is that it contains a high amount of arsenic. So that's probably what you're what you're describing. Arsenic is a heavy metal, and and, I, and usually when, usually when I um, give these sorts of presentations, when I tell them, you know, you shouldn't eat the, eat the sargassum or use it as fertilizer because of the arsenic, but people still do because the sargassum provides a good source of nutrients uh, for, your, for your fertilizers. Something that is in development in the University of Miami, uh, there were some scientists that tried to look at the compost made from sargassum. And it's not clear to me yet, but when they, when they test the compost in sargassum, they couldn't find the arsenic. So that is, to, to me, that's really weird. Uh, that, but the arsenic definitely has to go somewhere. And so my verdict is um, there are definitely other uses for uh, sargassum. The arsenic is a problem. Um, de approaches that are not very consumptive um, could definitely... For example, the sargassum adobe blocks that I was talking about, that could be an avenue uh, to, use, um, to use the sargassum biomass. So um, there's definitely a lot of articles related to how, how to best use sargassum, and it's definitely growing. 
Yes. Uh, I understand that the Sargassum Sea is now not anymore the only place where it lives, eh, where, where it floats. It went more down. Mm -hmm. But what I know is that the eel, uh, the fish, it breeds only at the Sargassum Sea. Then it goes to other countries, especially in Europe. And now it's almost uh, yeah, not anymore living in Europe because of the changing of the sea. That's the question. I mean, changing of where the Sargassum is. Uh, living now? Is that, is, do you know something about that? So you're asking about um, how fish used the sargassum in the Sargasso Sea and then made its way into Europe, um, but then you can't find it in Europe anymore, um, and why would that be? The short answer is, is I don't know. That's a very interesting question. I will say, and this is interesting because we see s the sargassum in the Caribbean as too much of a good thing. There are definitely conservation commissions for the Sargasso Sea because it's supposedly at a very endangered ecosystem. Um, it, it, yeah, they, in the, Sargass, the Sargassum in the Sargasso Sea is dubbed as the golden rainforest. And all the different fish and um, fauna d are definitely endemic. And of course, a lot of commercially important fish are, um, what is it, are definitely eating all the fauna living under the Sargassum. Um, but in terms of making it its habitat in Europe, I know sea turtles also use the sargassum in their gasso sea, so that's why I share that example. Um, but in terms of its disappearance, I'll be honest, I haven't really studied that, but that is really interesting. Yes? Um, some people tell me uh, when there is sargassum at Cold Bay, you shouldn't swim there because it might be a danger or a bad for your skin or whatever. Yes, that's a very good question. So the question is, um, should you swim in sargassum because it might give you a rash or some kind of skin irritation? So the short answer is kind of. The sargassum itself is not harmful um, in, in, ter in terms of giving you a rash. Um, there's also the issue of decomposition and releasing hydrogen sulfide gases, which gives headaches. What's probably giving you the itch are the epifauna, or the invertebrates attached to sargassum. And I can think of one. I don't think I have a picture here. Um, they're called hydroids. If you come to the, f I don't know if they're, um, if, if it's in the bag of sarga in broadly sargassum, um, but there are hydroids that kind of look like algae, but are really animals and are related to jellyfish. They're very tiny, and they still have their stinging cells. They can still sting even after they die. So I always thought that's probably what's giving you all the, ir the irritation and skin rashes, um, but that's going to be depend on each person's like allergic reaction um, somewhat to sargassum. Very good question. Just a reminder that we have three field projects tomorrow. There's plenty of space. If you sign up and participate in a field project, you get a free hat. Our hats are in. They are environmentally correct hats. They're made from recycled materials, and they're good looking. Sargasso. Yeah. Sargasso. <laughs> Plastic, we think. Um, but by all means, see Emily or Alexis at the back. Uh, you can go with Lowell at 4.30 tomorrow. There's a diving field project at 1.30 if you're a diver. And first thing in the morning is with Susan wrangling our anoles and doing blood samples to figure out their malaria parasites. So participate. Don't just sit home tomorrow. All right. And we'll see you in a few days for our next presentation. Thank you, everyone, locally and on our live streaming. And good night. Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics industry, Carib Trans has served the Caribbean region for more than 30 years, with a footprint that has grown from one island to now serving the majority, as well as Central and South America. Carib Trans is an NVOCC, a non-vessel operating common carrier, meaning it has the same responsibilities as a shipper without owning the vessels or planes. Its primary customers, individuals who ship clothing, electronics and other personal items, and occasionally cars. Most of the stuff that they're sending is because they, they don't get it there. So 
For us to provide it on two services, air and ocean, we can give you a choice of how fast you want it. So if you ran, want it really fast, we're going to send it by air, you're going to have it next day, sometimes even the same day. That on-time service has been the key to Parrot Trend's success, whether shipping by air or by sea. The company moves about 5,000 TEUs of freight each year, more than any NVOCC in the region. And since it joined the Saltchuk family of transportation companies a couple years ago, Carib Trans can offer customers even more shipping options. Other NVOCCs, they depend on other uh, shipping lines that are not part of their family. So they need to rely on whether they're going to sell or not, whether they are late or not. It doesn't happen to us because it's part of our family. Of, uh, of companies. We, we control the service that we give. Sí, buenos días, por favor, con Diana. Quality service is what keeps customers coming back. Customers are treated like family, and when they leave to research competitors, it doesn't usually last long. They have left and they have come back because they've said that, you know, nobody does it better <laughs> than current trends. So, because of that relationship. That exceptional service includes consolidation. Customers can have freight sent here and store for free for up to a month, then consolidated and shipped on to the islands and Americas, a perk for the region's growing small business market. Puerto Rico is an expanding market for Carib Trans, about the size of Connecticut and rich in history and culture. Puerto Rico is home to many pharmaceutical manufacturers, as well as a thriving tourism industry for which Carib Trans moves raw materials and supplies. But serving small businesses is still the company's bread and butter here in San Juan. Businesses like Aldera Cafe, a local coffee company, owner Alfredo Rodriguez started growing coffee beans at his mountain farm about 20 years ago. He recently ordered a variety of new equipment for his farm and shop. He uses Carib Trans because it consolidates shipments, which cuts down on the number of times he has to pay the Puerto Rico import tax. Not many companies want to do that. They want only big cargos and uh, maybe half container, full containers, but they don't, they don't want to consolidate because it's, uh, it's more difficult. Turning challenges into opportunities is what Carib Trans does, and that includes helping to grow small businesses like Caldera Cafe by taking the hassle out of shipping we uh, can be a gateway to expand their, their business in the Caribbean and, and back to the U.S. And wherever they can, they can sell their products, we are also going to be a partner for them. That customer dedication has made Carib Trans what it is today. Now as part of a larger family with more transportation resources, Carib Trans hopes to grow beyond its current market, offering services to additional Latin American ports and eventually Europe and Asia. But even when it becomes a global logistics company, Carib Trans wants to stay true to its roots, always providing personalized, reliable customer service and a commitment to the communities it serves. <laughs>